good afternoon. I guess it's technically afternoon now. Um, thank you so much, um, Kelsey, for inviting me today. I'm so, so grateful to be here. Um, and uh, I'm just sort of looking at the chat as everyone's putting their name and, and where they're calling in from, uh, which is really cool for me to see uh, the, the diversity of, of, of everyone who's on the call today. Thanks so much for, for choosing to tune in and um, for tuning into all of the previous sessions. Um, this is a really cool symposium. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you that I'm calling in from uh, Phoenix today. Usually I work out of Denver, Colorado, but uh, today I'm with family and feeling very blessed to be with family in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and get started um, as people are starting, are, are chiming in, in in the chat and um, we'll utilize the chat just one more time in just a couple of minutes. So uh, stay on there if you've had it, if you have it open. Um, my name is Kara and I work for the Laboratory to Combat Human Trafficking and we are a Denver-based nonprofit, um, been around since 2005 doing anti-trafficking work um, and we're primarily focused on Colorado but of course uh, Colorado has many similarities with uh, surrounding states um, and so I'll, I'll sort of generalize um, our work and um, and some of the vulnerabilities that we see throughout the Four Corners region, um, given uh, all of your locations. Um, so uh, I started doing anti-trafficking work about 15 years ago, um, uh, mostly overseas. So I was working in Africa and the Middle East and in Asia um, for about a decade and came back to the US and started working here in Colorado. And so, like many of you, I suspect, um, I used to think of trafficking as this thing that happens in this other place, you know, wherever that other place is in your mind. Um, and I, when I came back to start working on the issue here uh, in the States, um, I, I realized how similar actually trafficking looks um, in, the, in the US or even in, in the Four Corners region as, than it does, you know, in, in other countries that I was working in. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the root causes of trafficking, poverty, inequality, racism, um, trauma, right, really, really look very similar, no matter where you are. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, what does human trafficking look like in Colorado? What does it look like among uh, Native American communities? Um, what are those vulnerabilities that we all kind of share communities in community? Um, and uh, what can we do about it? Um, so let me see here, here we go. What I'm hoping that you can gain by the end of this training is that you'll understand the nuances that distinguish trafficking from other crimes. Um, not because we want you to be able to rate trafficking. We're never saying, you know, trafficking is worse than or better than some other crime that someone has experienced or lived experience that they've had, um, but rather we want you to be able to understand the nuances so that you can understand how better to support a survivor or also what their legal remedies may, may be and how they may be different. Um, we'll talk about some of the complexities of disclosure um, in and around reservations as well as um, not on reservations. Um, we want you to be able to identify potential victims or high-risk individuals through red flags or behavioral cues, but we also want you to be able to understand the complexities around disclosure. So be thinking about previous trainings that you've had um, when we're talking about like domestic violence, child abuse, interpersonal violence, generational trauma. Um, th those kinds of disclosures are always complicated. Uh, there's never like a one plus one equals trafficking. And so keep that in mind, it's very similar in a human trafficking uh, space. Um, and then we'll talk about the, the um, importance of developing pro protocols, a trauma-informed approach and multi-sector collaboration. Um, I realize that that's a lot of buzzwords in one short sentence, um, but it is so important that no matter what kind of work you're doing and uh, that intersects with uh, survivors, that you have a protocol in place um, even if uh, uh, seeing a human trafficking survivor in your work is rare, um, so that you feel empowered to make that identification so that you know what those next steps may be. Um, I hear from uh, providers often 
that they, they feel like they may have seen this in the past but didn't know what to do. And before they know it, the survivor is gone. Um, so just sort of keep that in mind. Um, of course, a trauma-informed approach is always uh, needed. Uh, human trafficking is a complex form of trauma, uh, happens over a long period of time uh, and multiple, multiple traumas. Um, and you know, no matter what it is that you do, um, you won't be um, expected to end human trafficking all on your own. It's going to require multi-sector collaboration. Um, it's going to require healthcare providers, people who are working with systems involved youth, tribal leaders, um, uh, regular community members um, to, to make a difference, to make a dent in, in this crime. Um, and so it's so important that everyone receives the training that we're all sort of on the same page around what human trafficking looks like. Um, so before I, I, I start talking about that definition, um, I'd love to hear from you all um, in the chat what you think the definition is, or you know, rather um, what words or phrases come to mind when you hear the term human trafficking? Who are we talking about? What does it look like? Uh, you know, what, what movies or TV shows have you seen? Um, what, is, what is human trafficking to you? I'm not looking for a textbook definition, of course, but you know, what, what, what rises to the surface when you hear this term? Um, and while you're doing that, I am going to talk a little bit about how we developed this term actually. So um, the term human trafficking was first defined in the year 2000, um, so 20 years ago. Uh, we came together as an international community, the UN came together um, and defined human trafficking for the first time. Um, we first started using the term in the 90s, um, but it wasn't defined into statute um, until, until the year 2000. So what that means is we have this really old crime, right? The, the crime of exploitation. Um, humans have been exploiting other humans since the beginning of humans. Um, but we've got this really new response. 20 years isn't very long. Um, and so what that means is that many of the people who are in positions where they should be uh, providing services for survivors haven't been trained um, specifically on human trafficking. Um, and that includes law enforcement, healthcare providers, you know, people working with systems involved, youth service providers of all kinds, people working in the homelessness space. Um, many people haven't had a human trafficking training. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, there's additionally, <laughs> there's been an awful lot of misinformation lately. Um, I would say uh, during the, the presidential uh, election, which I'm sorry, I don't mean to bring that up. I don't want to traumatize anyone with that conversation, but um, you know, there were conspiracy theories circling um, people were seeing a lot of things popping up on their social media about human trafficking. And in all honesty, a lot of it was wrong. Um, and so there's just a lot in the water right now. Um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time here trying to kind of get down to the basics of what this definition actually is from a legal perspective and what we see um, on the ground in our work. Um, and of course, making that relevant to uh, the Native American communities all around the Four Corners uh, area. And so um, I'm just looking at what you all put into the chat and I so appreciate that, thank you. Um, I see sexual assault, missing people. I see labor trafficking, which is great. I'm glad somebody brought that up. Kidnapping, uh, I, see the, I see the word sex a few times, exploitation, manipulation. Um, and uh, thank you for all of that. Uh, bondage, yeah. And I, I like that somebody added in there the Taken movie um, that is like, <laughs> the most popular kind of Hollywood portrayal of human trafficking and it's quite unrealistic. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, you know, the only thing a lot of people know about human trafficking and so I get it. Um, so so let's, let's spend some time um, getting to the, the root of, of this word or these words. Um, so this is how we defined human trafficking, the, the definition you see on your screen right now um, in, in that international meeting in the year 2000, it was called the Palermo Protocol. We defined human trafficking as a severe form of exploitation for labor, which includes sex as a form of labor, think about like stripping for money, through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. So a couple of things to note here and how this differs from the US federal definition um, is that we included sex as a form of labor in this international definition, 
And we also said there has to be an element of force, fraud or coercion for it to be trafficking. If there isn't, then we're probably looking at some other crime, something equally terrible and related, but not necessarily trafficking, okay? Um, in that same year, in the year 2000, we wrote our federal definition of human trafficking. Um, and we defined it a little bit differently. Um, and this is gonna affect all of us, um, all the states uh, as well as reservations. And then we also have our own laws on reservation and within every state. Um, so that makes everything a little bit complicated as it always does from a legal perspective. Um, but let's talk about this federal definition. So you'll remember in the previous slide, I said, um, human trafficking, or sorry, labor trafficking and sex trafficking were sort of lumped together at the international level. At the federal level here in the US, um, we actually said that sex trafficking and labor trafficking were different. Um, so we parsed those out into different categories. And then additionally, we added um, uh, an exception to that forced fraud or coercion rule. We said that anyone under the age of 18 involved in commercial sex is by definition a victim of trafficking regardless of whether or not there's force, fraud, or coercion. So that may seem uh, obvious, but it's complex. And so I'm gonna talk through uh, the way that we parsed out this definition for a little bit. I'm gonna stay on this slide. Um, it's important for your mandatory reporting requirements and for uh, disclosure. So what we said by saying that anyone under the age of 18 involved in commercial sex is by definition a victim of trafficking, is that they're a victim of trafficking regardless of how they self-identify. Now, if no one is forcing or frauding or coercing someone who's say 17 years old into trading sex to meet their survival needs, then they might be confused when you told them that they were a victim of something. They would say, what do you mean? I'm choosing to do this, right? I'm doing it because I have to, to survive. Now you could certainly argue that society is forcing them to do it, right? We would call that constrained choice, um, but that's not how our laws are written uh, most of the time, right? So our laws say there's no human forcing or frauding or coercing this person into doing this, and therefore they're doing it by choice. But the way that we wrote this law says they can't make that choice if they're under the age of 18. We're saying that they don't have the cognitive ability to consent to commercial sex in the writing of the law this way. Um, and so Though you may agree with that, there are also lots of people under the age of 18 who would disagree, right? Um, and, and many of us who work in, in victim services might already know that, right? There's people under the age of 18 who are trading sex to meet their survival needs who don't consider themselves victims of trafficking. Um, what this law does do is it protects those individuals from getting arrested for crimes that they're committing as a result of their trafficking experience. So by calling them a victim of, of trafficking, regardless of how they self-identify, what we're saying is that they cannot be arrested for that crime, like the crime of prostitution, for example. Um, they can only be protected as victims. Um, what else makes this uh, definition unique is that you can have a victim of a crime, uh, according to this law, without there being a perpetrator, right? So. Uh, we're saying there can be someone who's selling sex of their own volition, but they're under the age of 18. So there's no trafficker. There's no one forcing or fronting or coercing them into doing this, but they are still a victim. And that's rare. We don't have a lot of laws where you can have a victim of something without there being a perpetrator. Um, now, in this case, there would be a sex buyer, but they wouldn't be a trafficker. They'd be a sex buyer, probably breaking all kinds of other laws, buying sex from someone under the age of 18, but they wouldn't be a trafficker. So it's complicated. Um, it's complicated to call someone a victim of something when that's not how they self-identify. People don't generally like that, so you can get some resistance there, um, and it would be unlikely to have a, a disclosure from somebody who didn't self-identify that way. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't plenty of people who are being forced, uh, frauded, or coerced under the age of 18, uh, who are clearly being sex trafficked. Um, what it means is it's just a little complicated. Um, and then just a couple of notes here, uh, that commercial component means trading anything of value. You heard me use the word trade a couple of times. Um, it could be money that they're trading sex or sex act for, but uh, it could also be drugs, a ride, a bus ticket, protection, um, really anything that is of commercial value makes it commercial sex. And I use the example of prostitution, um, but it's any sex act, uh, stripping, pornography, webcamming, any commercial sex act with someone under the age of 18 is trafficking, okay? 
So now if we move on to the second category, um, those who are 18 and over, we said that's a little different. We said there does have to be an element of force, fraud, or coercion for it to be trafficking. And that's recognizing that some people enter into the sex trade voluntarily, of course, sex workers, um, people who choose to sell sex or other sex acts uh, to make money. So what we're saying is if you're over the age of 18, you can make that decision. If you are not being forced or frauded or coerced, then you are a sex worker. If you are being forced, frauded or coerced, then you are a victim of sex trafficking, right? Um, and that also may seem straightforward, but isn't. Um, and that's because um, most of the time, someone is being trafficked by someone that they know and often by someone that they know and love. Um, so contrary to the movie Taken, contrary to sort of popular social media myth, the overwhelming majority of sex trafficking cases are being perpetrated by someone that the, the, the victim knows, uh, a parent or guardian, a cousin, an uncle, a brother, a sister. Uh, it could be a boyfriend or girlfriend, could be a husband or wife. Um, sometimes it's an employer. Sometimes it's a teacher or a coach. Um, we've had cases of religious leaders, people in positions of power uh, who are trafficking uh, people who were in positions of lower power. Um, but several studies will tell us that in some cases, 90% of survivors are being trafficked by someone that they know. Um, and often someone that they know and love, uh, as you heard me sort of um, illustrate there with those examples. Um, and so that means that proving those elements of force, fraud or coercion are, are complicated at best um, and really challenging. Um, and so again, in these situations, often people don't self-identify as victims of trafficking because they, they don't see themselves in that common narrative that we have on you know, Google or social media. Um, they may know that they're in a relationship that feels abusive or that doesn't feel right. Um, and, but they usually won't self-identify with those words, human trafficking. They won't necessarily know that what's happening to them is illegal. Um, and they won't usually ask for help. Sometimes they will, of course. Um, in those cases, even when someone does disclose, sometimes they aren't believed. And that's because, again, as I mentioned earlier, many people who are in positions where they're supposed to be helping survivors have not had this training and don't understand those complexities. Let's say in a perfect world, somebody discloses and they are believed. Let's say the law enforcement officer is able to arrest the perpetrator or the, the accused perpetrator. Even then in that kind of perfect scenario, proving force, fraud or coercion in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt is really challenging. So I'm not talking about believing the survivor. We can believe them uh, that they've experienced force, fraud or coercion and still not be able to prove it in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, because think about it, right? If someone was coercing you into the situation and say they threatened to hurt your little sister or have your family member deported or have you arrested for some crime that you were forced to commit, those, those, that proof of that coercion is gonna be really hard to find, right? They didn't write it down somewhere and hand it to you on a piece of paper, right? So it's gonna be a, you know, they said, they said kind of thing. Um, and it, that might not hold up in a court of law. And so even when everyone is believing the survivor, even when the, the perpetrator is arrested, um, often these crimes get pled down to other crimes like sexual assault or kidnapping or something else that's easy, more easy to prove. So our, our numbers, the number of cases that we have from a law enforcement standpoint, often don't reflect the reality, right? People don't self-identify, they don't ask for help. Often they will even lie to protect, protect themselves or their perpetrator because they love them, they formed a trauma bond with them. And even when they are believed and do disclose, they're really hard to prove in a court of law. So those, those cases, those actual case numbers, those convictions that we have of traffickers, those are just a drop in the bucket um, of, of the number of cases that we actually have. And then this third category here is around forced labor. Um, this is the one that isn't sexy, doesn't get, movies don't get made about it. Uh, you can barely find anything about it on Google. Um, it's, it's not the thing that gets talked about. It doesn't fit our common narrative. And that's really unfortunate because it's actually the majority of cases. 
Um, and so we see labor trafficking in uh, the kinds of industries that sort of lend themselves to that underground market. Like, so we see it in agriculture, ranching, um, energy, uh, marijuana farming. We see it in um, uh, construction. Uh, we see it in the hospitality sector, restaurants, hotels, uh, landscaping, um, domestic servitude, where someone is, you know, living and working in someone's home, maybe as a nanny, maybe as a domestic servant. Those kinds of um, industries that are low wage, high turnover, um, high immigrant population, uh, those are the ones that sort of lend themselves to potential exploitation. It's a way for uh, people to sort of not be able to see it, even though it's right on the surface. Um, so we see it in those regular markets. We also see it in illicit markets. So we see a lot of forced uh, criminal activity, forced drug muling across the southern border from Mexico. Um, let's say someone is experiencing violence in El Salvador, uh, gang violence, and the gang threatens to hurt somebody's sister and mother if they don't mule drugs across the southern border. So of course they do. Uh, let's say he's a young man, 22 years old, muling drugs across the southern border from El Salvador, uh, gets picked up by Colorado border, I mean, Colorado, sorry, uh, by, by border patrol. And um, that person would, would get arrested and deported, right? It would be highly unlikely that they would say, help me border patrol, I'm a victim of human trafficking because they don't self-identify that way. They don't know that definition and they're terrified right? Their, their family's being threatened. And it's not Border Patrol's fault either. You know, they would, they would just see a drug dealer in front of them. Um, and so you can see how this sort of flies under the radar. Um, we see it on the streets um, in cities all over the Four Corners area as well, where drug dealers are forcing people to sell drugs on the street. Um, we also see forced other illicit activity like breaking and entering, um, often to pay back a debt, um, or potentially having to do with gang violence, but not always. Um, we also see like forced begging. Um, sometimes we see people being forced to sell sex and also rob the person that's purchasing the sex. That would be both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, so this doesn't always look like what we think it's going to look like. Um, we've had a lot of cases lately, like in the last five years of illegal marijuana grows um, all over the Four Corners region in Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. Um, where um, uh, foreign nationals have come in, purchased, or really just uh, uh, kind of squatted on land, growing marijuana illegally, and forcing people to work on those farms illegally. That would also be forced labor in an illicit market. Um, so uh, just something to be thinking about um, outside of, of sex trafficking. Um, this isn't limited to those who are foreign born youth or females. It's just sort of a shout out to some of those myths and misconceptions that we often have around trafficking. Um, it isn't, it certainly isn't only happening to foreign nationals. It's happening to people in their state, from their state. Um, it's happening to youth, but not only youth. Um, that Again, that's what gets pictured on, on Google or what we hear about in social media, but actually the overwhelming majority of cases are people who are 18 and over. Um, youth are certainly vulnerable to trafficking, um, but not necessarily the majority. Uh, youth are vulnerable because of the unequal power dynamic, um, but you know, adults have unequal power dynamics with other adults. Of course, we know that, right? So um, it's really often a, a matter of power and control, um, and that's why youth can be more vulnerable. Additionally, youth's brains aren't fully developed yet, right? Our brains don't fully develop until we're 25. Um, and so young people are physiologically more likely to make risky choices. So we do see youth trafficked for both sex and for labor. Sometimes they don't know their rights, especially in a labor space. They don't know minimum wage. Um, they don't know they're supposed to get paid overtime or work a certain number of hours per week. And so they're taken advantage of in that way. Um, and this doesn't just happen to females, not even in the sex trafficking space. Though more females are trafficked for sex than males or transgender individuals, um, it's around 75% of sex trafficking cases are female and that leaves 25% males or, or transgender. Um, and so of course, it, again, it's just something that we forget about and, and we know that there's fewer disclosures um, from male and transgender individuals um, again, because they don't see themselves in that common narrative. When it comes to labor trafficking, it's about 
We see females trafficked in certain uh, industries and, and more males trafficked in other industries, but it's around 50-50 overall. Okay, so in your work, um, another way to be thinking through this definition or to, to sort of make an identification um, is to use this action means purpose model. So uh, one thing from each one of these categories has to be present for it to be trafficking. There has to be an action, a means, and a purpose. Okay, so I'm gonna talk through some scenarios here so you can sort of, can sort of picture what I mean by this. Um, by far and away, the most common action is recruitment. So people are identified as being vulnerable, right? They're vulnerable for so many reasons um, because there's no economic opportunity where they live and they're offered a job doing something somewhere else. Come with me. I know this great place where we can work or my cousin owns a farm or a restaurant. We can go work there. There's more opportunity in the city. Come with me, right? Um, or people are recruited because they need love because they've suffered abuse or neglect at home. They're not finding love at home. They don't have a really good version of what a healthy relationship should be. And someone finds them online and says, come with me, I'll love you. You know, I'll take care of you. I'll take you away from that abusive household that you're in and I'll bring you somewhere better. Run away with me, right? Um, or somebody could be recruited from a school. We've got peer-to-peer -peer recruitment happening um, in schools or in congregate care. Uh, even in, on colleges, when I say schools, I mean, you know, elementary, middle, high school and colleges, universities as well, where a trafficker will sort of coerce a peer to uh, lure someone into a situation, right? Let's, let's run away from this uh, shelter that we're in. This place sucks. I've got someone who will take care of us outside. Um, so we've got peer-to-peer -peer recruitment. We've got online recruitment, in-person recruitment, sometimes uh, recruitment um, signs that are offering good jobs. Um, but the point is that people are identified as being vulnerable and the trafficker is trying to fill their need by offering them a job, offering them love, offering them whatever it is that they need a house if they're experiencing homelessness, a place to stay even just for the night, right? So it's it's those most vulnerable that are uh, to really anything like those kind of marginalized folks who are sort of living on the edges that are vulnerable to trafficking through this recruitment action. Um, sometimes people are harbored that's held somewhere against their will, not allowed to leave, not allowed to run, uh, locked up, chained up. Uh, Google would have us believe that everybody is in this situation, as would the movie Taken and, and some other, uh, you know, TV shows that have portrayed trafficking. And it's simply not true. Um, it does happen. Absolutely. People are sometimes locked up and often in labor trafficking situations. Um, we'll see it in agricultural sites. People are working during the day and they're housed in a congregate housing at night where they're locked in. There might be a fence. There might even be someone standing guard to make sure they don't try to run. Um, we've seen it in massage parlors, we've seen it in uh, restaurant situations, um, but most of the time people don't really need to be locked up because they're being held under coercive threats, right? If you try to run, I'm going to hurt your family. If you try to run, they'll arrest you, they won't believe you, right? They'll be asked, they'll come after you. So they're threatened and that's what's holding them in the place. It's not necessarily locks and chains. Um, Sometimes people are transported, transported across a state border, transported across town, you know, in some cases transported across an international border. Um, and sometimes people are, are purposefully trying to escape the place where they live, right? In smaller, more rural communities, people are, are transported to places where they believe there may be more economic opportunity or even uh, opportunities for education. So sometimes transportation is part of someone's experience, but also to be clear, often people are being trafficked by their own parents, right? In Farmington and never leave Farmington. So transportation is one possible action. Um, sometimes people are, are purposefully moved around so as not to raise suspicion. So they might be being trafficked um, in one restaurant for three months and then moved to another restaurant um, as people are, are sort of getting suspicious in the, in the, in the town that they're in um, or from one farm to another farm, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes people are provided. That is, um, I provide access to my kids in exchange for drugs or in exchange for rent. Um, we've seen an uptick of this alongside the opioid crisis um, where uh, someone is looking for drugs and the drug dealer will kind of lean on the person to allow access to their kids. Um, 
we've seen an uptick of, of this alongside the COVID crisis as well. Um, a lot of this is exacerbated by COVID where people are desperate and they're unable to pay rent. So we see it uh, predominantly in like low income neighborhoods or mobile home parks where a landlord might live close by to the, the renters and can sort of lean on coerce somebody into allowing access or providing access to their kids or to themselves to trade sex or labor uh, for rent or something like that. Or someone could be obtained. Um, that's that snatched off the street, you know, the Taken movie. Um, could that happen? Has that happened? Sure, of course. Um, but it is definitely not the common narrative. In fact, in, in 15 years of doing this work, I don't think I've ever met anyone who didn't know their trafficker to some extent. Um, but it could happen. It's just not what we're really looking for. It's not very common. Um, the means is through force, fraud, or coercion. Right, forces physical force, you know, uh, beatings or or being locked up. Fraud is a fraudulent promise, fraudulent promise of love, fraudulent promise of work, right? Something like that. Um, and coercion is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, uh, threatening to report someone to the authorities, threatening to expose someone, threatening to have someone's kids taken away, uh, threatening to have yourself taken. Like if you're being trafficked by a parent, the parent might say. If you tell on me, they'll arrest me, they'll break up our family, is that what you want, right? So uh, coercion can be used in many, many ways. Um, often someone's legal status might be used against them, et cetera. Um, but the big star there is to remind us that we do not need elements of forced fraud or coercion to prove trafficking for someone who's under the age of 18 involved in commercial sex, that's an exception. And then the purpose is for commercial sex or labor. So at its core, trafficking is about profit, and that's what often differentiates it from other crimes. So um, I'm gonna talk through a couple of examples here so we can better understand what I mean by that. Um, so these are, these are heavy examples. So just kind of deep breaths as I talk through this. Um, so someone might be experiencing multiple crimes at once. Anyone who works in victim services knows that, right? So uh, let's say a, a young girl is being sexually assaulted by her father. If a young girl is being sexually assaulted by her father, then she's experiencing child abuse, sexual assault, domestic violence, but not necessarily trafficking. But if the father was say taking video and putting that video online and making a profit, that would make it trafficking also, that would make it commercial. Or if he was inviting friends over and allowing access to his kid for money, that would make it commercial. So someone could be experiencing all four of those crimes at once, but not necessarily trafficking unless there was a commercial component. Um, and then when it comes to labor trafficking, people will often ask, you know, what the difference is between wage theft and labor trafficking since they're both non-payment of wages. So I'll talk through a different scenario. So let's say um, a kid in Durango, a 22 year old undocumented kid from uh, Central America somewhere, um, used to have a job as a, as a, a dishwasher at a restaurant, but it closed because of COVID. Um, so he's, he's kind of desperate for work um, and he meets a local restaurant owner in Durango who says, I've got a job for you. I need a dishwasher. Um, I'll pay under the table. I know you're undocumented, that's cool. Um, let's say uh, they agree for him to work six days a week, 12 hours a day for $12 an hour. So the kid shows up every day, works 12 hours a day for six days a week for two weeks. And they agree that he'll get paid at the end of two weeks. So when he goes to get his payment, the, the local restaurant owner says, not gonna pay you, right? I'm not gonna pay you, I, I, you, you you're, you're undocumented, no one's gonna believe you. I'm a respected business owner in this town. You know, No one's gonna believe you get out of here, right? Um, if that kid can walk out the door and um, go get a lawyer and sue that business owner for wage theft, then that's exactly what he's experienced is wage theft. If however, he can't walk out that door because the door's locked, because he's being physically assaulted, because he's being threatened with deportation. If you dare leave, I'll call ICE on you or I'll have your family deported. Um, then he's being trafficked. That's when force or fraud or coercion will come into play. Um, so that's the difference between wage theft and labor trafficking. It's not quite always that easy to identify, but, but you generally get an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so I want us to understand that um, no matter where we are, um, we have trafficking survivors among us. 
Um, trafficking survivors are not stupid. They're not deviant. They're not making bad choices. In fact, they're making really good choices, smart choices, in fact, um, that, that, that are allowing them to fill their needs. Um, so if someone's experienced abuse or neglect or isolation and they're looking for love and someone offers them love, then it's very human to go lean towards that, right? To go after that love. We're all looking for relationships with other humans. And if someone offers us that thing that we're looking for, it makes a lot of sense to kind of go after it, right? Um, if someone's experiencing homelessness, well then they've got a lot of needs that need to be filled. It is cold in the winter here, right? It is dangerous on the street. And if someone says, I've got a place for you to stay, you know, come with me. Well, that sounds good. You know, I need a place to stay. Um, and additionally, you know, there are shelters, right? Of course there are shelters uh, for people experiencing homelessness, but not nearly enough of them. Um, and the ones that we do have, have a ton of barriers, right? Around identity and sobriety. Um, you've got to be the right age. You've got to be the right gender. You've got to get there on time. You can't have kids or you have to have kids. You can't have a dog. You have to be sober, right? There's all of these rules that we put up in, in front of, you know, housing in general. And it just makes it cha really challenging. If you're a transgender youth in, in the greater Denver area, which is a place I'm pretty familiar with, there's only two shelters in the whole city that will even allow you in, right? Um, it's, it, and, I, and, I, and I can't speak to every rural community, um, but I'm assuming that that's true uh, kind of across the board. Um, and so if someone says, I've got a place for you to stay, you might say, all right, take me there. Like whatever it takes to get off the street, right? Um, if someone's experiencing debt or can't access the formal economy for some reason, um, they can't get a job because they have a felony charge on their record and no one will hire them because they're undocumented, because they have no skills, whatever the reason, we all need income, right? Um, and so if someone can't get a job in the formal economy, they'll look in the informal economy, you know, similar to that story I was telling about the dishwasher. Um, we all need work. So they're not making bad choices by taking work that's offered to them. The trafficker is exploiting their vulnerability, right? By not paying them or not allowing them to leave or threatening or hurting them. Um, if someone's, you know, has a marginalized identity or is facing discrimination and someone offers an opportunity, you know, acceptance, you are beautiful, right? That might be the very first time someone ever heard that. <laughs> um, and it's very human to lean into that. So it's not that people are making bad choices. It's not that they're stupid. It's that traffickers are taking advantage of that vulnerability and we need to be doing better, right? On the other side of it, service providers, society in general, like we need to be doing better. And I'm not criticizing anyone in particular, like that's why you're on this call is to learn more about what you can do. Um, it's just that generally speaking, we don't have enough resources. We're not providing for the folks most marginalized and most needing our help. And so traffickers are stepping in and they're filling that void. Um, specific vulnerabilities on tribal lands that are sort of exacerbated again by COVID crisis um, and are just in addition to all of the vulnerabilities that we've already talked through are, are, are evident on this slide, right? Historical oppression, um, the way that we have uh, portrayed Native American women, especially over the last 500 years um, in terms of fetishes and colonial descriptions, generational trauma, um, a lot of the cases that I'm aware of, uh, people have been victimized through generations, right? And that has been uh, sort of internalized by, by victims. Um, lack of ec economic on opportunity on some tribal lands. Uh, people are wanting to leave to find jobs elsewhere. Um, and then they're kind of tricked into uh, some great job opportunity. Um, I put on here jurisdictional mess. Um, it, it gets more and more complex the more that I understand it, but it depends on what reservation that you're on, um, you know, who has the authority to convict who or arrest who for any crime, um, including trafficking, right? Where did it happen? Did it happen in a casino or near a casino? Who was the perpetrator? Were they, were they someone from off the reservation or on the reservation? Who was the victim? Were they from on or off the reservation? Did someone from a reservation area get uh, assaulted off the reservation, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a jurisdictional mess. Some, some tribal lands have their own law enforcement systems. Some rely on uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs or the FBI. Um, and so uh, then in some cases, uh, 
those crimes have to be prosecuted via the federal law versus the state law, it's a mess. Um, and I think people don't know who to report to, um, making it much less, much more difficult to report at all. Um, obviously cultural barriers to conversation um, within on reservations, there's a lack of human trafficking laws that I'm aware of. There are only 10 of the 573 federally recognized tri tribal lands that have human trafficking laws at all. Um, and so th in those cases, they would have to be prosecuted via a, a, the federal human trafficking law. You would have to get the FBI in there in order to do that or the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, so, so it's just a mess. Um, obviously in some places, um, people are geographically isolated. They don't have access to cell phones or cell phones don't work, um, in those areas or don't have access to internet, making reporting again, much more difficult. Um, and then overall, just a lack of training, not just on tribal lands, but everywhere. Um, and, and, an, and an uptick of substance abuse alongside all of these kind of intersecting crises. Um, additionally, I'm just like the bearer of bad news today. Um, everything has been exacerbated by COVID. So um, those who were already being exploited continue to be exploited, right? No one said, oh, the, co the, the, the COVID crisis has hit, like go free now, right? Um, so uh, everyone is being affected economically. Uh, those who were already being exploited are being exploited even more so. Uh, during this crisis and the demand for sex has not decreased at all uh, during this time. Um, there's an increased ris risk of exploitation for many, um, again, because we're in this really unprecedented time of economic downturn um, so rapidly. There's now, I think the number is 7 million people out of work uh, in the US, um, down from 40 million you know, a few months ago. Um, and those folks need to work, right? We're all needing to work. And so as you have people more desperate for work, you have that potential for exploitation. Um, and then we have disrupted response efforts. So when we were doing um, uh, inspections uh, prior to COVID, we stopped doing them, right? We're not inspecting farms right now. We're not in inspecting restaurants, we're staying away. Um, we don't have eyes on kids. Kids aren't in school in some cases, or they are, but not as much. Um, and so uh, there was a, a pretty much a downturn of, of reporting for child abuse and neglect um, early on. It has now, there's now been an uptick um, as we've moved on in this crisis. But generally speaking, uh, people are, are stuck at home with their abusers. Stay in place orders have meant that people who are feeling this economic pressure are stuck home with the people that they abuse, right? feeling this economic pressure. So we've had an uptick of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, in some cases, people were released from detention centers, colleges and universities directly into homelessness. Um, people are isolated. Um, everything is limited support because everyone is sort of on high alert. Um, and then there's just an increase of online education. Um, so everyone's online more, right? Um, generally speaking, we're all online more. That's what we're doing right now. Um, and so, that means that people are able to be recruited online more. And we've, we've heard that from the FBI, that that's what's happened. Um, so uh, I'll make sure that I leave enough, uh, enough time for uh, questions at the end, but I'm gonna get through a few more slides. Um, if we Google trafficking, this is what comes up, right? The ideal victim, usually over-sexualized young females, usually white or Asian uh, being trafficked for sex. Um, and this does happen, right? This is a problem. But the problem with uh, portraying it in this limited way is that if this is all we think exists, is this is, if this is all we're looking for, then this is all we'll ever find. And if this is all we'll ever find, then this is all we'll ever be able to prosecute. And it's like a feedback loop. If this is all we ever look for, this is all we ever find. And so this is all we think exists. And so this is all we ever look for. Um, and not only that, but if we're, if we're, if we're not portraying it accurately, um, more inclusive of other gender identities and lived experiences and ages, um, then, then the individuals who are experiencing that exploitation won't know that what's happening to them is in fact trafficking and that it's illegal and that there are resources out there to protect them. So we have to change this narrative, right? To be more inclusive of everyone's lived experiences. Um, these are some 
uh, th this was an analysis, uh, a research analysis of, of some of the trafficking cases that we've seen in Indian country. And these were some reoccurring themes. So we saw, we saw, and these are cases though that got reported, right? And got investigated. So that's just a, a, a small portion of actual cases that they were able to research. So always keep that in mind. Um, but they found that many of the cases were internet-based, traffickers were directly recruiting victims purposefully uh, because of their identity or because of their location or some intersecting vulnerabilities. Um, drugs were typically involved. Victims were promised a better life um, and they were isolated and removed from their families. Those were, those were the reoccurring themes in, in this study. Um, additionally, uh, in cases originating from rural communities, um, we saw that victims were lured to nearby cities, um, sometimes by family members or boyfriends, um, something other than money like drugs was being exchanged. And the victim, victim typically had a history of prior victimization, which we know uh, of course is, is high on, on reservations or among native communities. Um, so when we're, when we're talking about the issue of trafficking in general, we're, we're asking people to care about those who are often perceived as unworthy and rarely considered victims. We do a lot of victim blaming in our society in general. Um, and I'm not asking you necessarily to agree with all of the choices that people make, right? I'm not asking you to, to agree with the choice. Well, you could vehemently disagree, in fact, with many of the choices that some of the victims have made. Um, but what I'm trying to point out here is that we have decided in, in the United States as a society that everyone has access to their basic human rights. And that includes uh, the access to work um, and to be free. Um, so no matter how much you hate the choices that someone's made, we can still hopefully all agree that they should have access to their basic human rights. And even though they've made bad choices or what you might consider to be bad choices, they still shouldn't be exploited. Right, and that includes sex workers, those who are undocumented, people experiencing homelessness, people who've run away, um, people who are using substances. All the people should have access to their basic human rights. So um, again, we really want to shift this narrative away from um, some of the things, some of the the really unhealthy narratives that we see online. Um, and towards, again, our most marginalized, what's happening on the fringes? What are we missing? Because we're, we're blaming people for their bad choices instead of supporting them out of exploitative situations. Um, so something to remember when we're making identifications is that anyone who's experienced trafficking has experienced complex trauma. Um, so I'm not gonna give you a trauma training right now. Of course, I don't have time. Hopefully you've had one during the, this, this symposium. Um, but what, what I do wanna say is we're talking about psychological trauma and anyone who's experienced trafficking has experienced the psychological trauma. And so what happens when you're stuck in uh, trauma mode or when you experience complex trauma is that your brain gets stuck in survival mode. Um, you're, you're fighting to survive. You've, many of us have heard fight, flight or freeze. Um, your brain is fighting to survive constantly. Um, so you're escalated right, even in common situations. And so people don't behave the way we think they should, right? Um, we think people will ask us for help. We think people will run away from their trafficker, but what we know is they won't um, because they've experienced that trauma and their brain is, is physiologically functioning differently than it did before they experienced the trauma. People are experiencing shame and embarrassment. They don't wanna tell you about all the terrible things that they've been forced to do they have a sense of duty or loyalty to their trafficker because their trafficker is their parent, right? Or their husband. Um, and so they're protecting them as, as well as themselves. There's fear, right? They've been threatened. Um, and there's a mistrust of institutions or law enforcement. There's a lot of root causes for that. In a lot of cases, people have been trafficked for a long time since they were young um, and everyone has missed it. So they have no uh, belief that authority figures will help them. Um, so they, they start to mistrust, plus they've been trained to mistrust. The traffickers telling them no one's gonna believe you, they're out to get you, they're gonna arrest you for crimes that you were forced to commit, right? Um, so people refuse their services. They show no emotional reactions whatsoever. It's a, it's a, it's a byproduct of trauma. Um, they may be irritable, they may be uninterested in cooperating. Um, often people don't have the language to put to their experience. Either they don't speak English or they just don't have the words, 
Um, they may be unaware or unable to access their rights. They don't know their rights. Um, they don't know the, the wage laws in the US. Um, they're purposefully socially or physically isolated, um, told that they won't be able to be, be, be believed or that they can't actually run anywhere because they're in rural communities and there's nowhere to run to. Um, and so I have this list of, of physical and behavioral cues here, but I'm just gonna go through it really quickly um, because I can, I can send these to you and you can kind of Google red flags and behavioral cues and they're gonna be different no matter what, depending on what you do for a living. And it's so diverse, um, uh, those of you who are you know, on this call that I wasn't able to really put together a, a complete list you know, of all the potential red flags. Um, so it depends on what you do or where you might see a survivor and, and what kind of work. Um, I would say some of the big ones are signs of malnourishment. Um, people are withholding, traffickers are withholding basic human needs. So water, food, sleep. Um, people are kept up for days at a time. Um, they're not fed or, or have access to water and that makes them much less likely to run, more compliant. Um, it can also induce psychosis, right? When you've been kept up for days at a time, potentially fed tons of drugs, um, that substance misuse at the, at the bottom of this page, it's really important to remember that sometimes people are targeted because they were already using substances. Sometimes they're being forced to use substances to keep them compliant. Um, or maybe they're using substances to sort of ease some of the pain of their lived experience. Um, sexual trauma, you know, repeated STIs, of course, in a sex trafficking situation that can be common. Um, evidence of prolonged infection or time since injury. Similar to domestic violence, we see old injuries, you know, um, bruises or old breaks that never healed properly because people weren't allowed to access healthcare. Um, and then from a behavioral perspective, um, someone who doesn't know where they are, that's a big red flag. Um, Cause I said, people are moved around or taken places outside of their communities, um, of course on purpose. Um, and so if they don't know where they are um, and they're accessing your resources, that should be a big red flag. Um, inconsistencies can be someone lying to protect their trafficker, someone lying to protect themselves, someone lying because they don't trust you, um, or it could be trauma. They can't remember what happened to them, or they've been kept up for days at a time and they're taking meth. They, they are actually experiencing psychosis and cannot remember all of the things that, has ha that have happened, um, which would sound like an inconsistency or a lie, even though it wasn't. Um, someone who's claiming to speak for or on behalf of someone else, that one's a little bit more obvious. Um, you know, youth having relationships with older unexplained adults, that can be lots of things. You know, we don't want people to be jumping to conclusions. Um, so if you do develop a protocol, um, make sure that you have a list of the red flags that are most likely to be seen in your profession. Um, and when two, three, four, five of those red flags would pop up, that's when your protocol would kick in. Um, I'm going to give you two sets of numbers now. For those of you who are in Colorado, uh, this is Colorado's human trafficking hotline number. I'm going to give you the national for those of you who are outside of Colorado on the next slide, and then we can take uh, a few minutes for questions. Um, so both the, the Colorado human trafficking hotline and the national human trafficking hotline are tip and referral hotlines. So you can call in a tip, uh, that someone you want to contact law enforcement, or you can call in for resources. You could excuse me, you could call in as a service provider on behalf of someone else, or the survivor can call themselves. Of course, we always prefer that survivors call for themselves, but they're not always gonna want to. Um, so you can call and get the resources that you need. Um, the reason I'm showing you the Colorado hotline um, is because we run that hotline. We've got about 340 resources around the state um, represented to support survivors uh, on this hotline. And so we've got a lot more resources in Colorado than the national hotline has in Colorado, right? So that's why I'm showing you this one's a little bit more personalized. For those of you who are in Colorado, you can call, you can text, uh, you can also search online. Um, one thing that's important to know is when we do call law enforcement, when we're requested to call law enforcement, uh, we are calling our trusted and trained law enforcement partners. We're not sort of like randomly calling a department or an agency um, and hoping for the best. We're, we're calling people we know have been trained and who understand the nuances around this crime and, and trauma um, in order to respond. Um, same thing for the national hotline. And I'm gonna end with this slide. 
Um, so for any of you who are outside of Colorado, you can call this number and they have like all the things that I just mentioned about the Colorado hotline are true for the national hotline as well. Um, all of the individuals on the national and the, the Colorado hotline have been trained uh, in Colorado. They go through 35 hours of in-person training and about 12 hours online and continuing education throughout the year. Um, in order to be able to have these conversations. So you can call and ask questions. You can call and have a conversation like, I don't really know if this is trafficking, but let's talk through this. Um, you can remain anonymous if you'd like. Um, it's totally up to you. We'll ask your name, but uh, if you don't wanna tell us, that's okay too. Um, yeah, so that's what I've got 